Let's talk all things coronavirus. In fact, by the time you finish watching this video, I will wager that you're going to be getting emails from your children's school, maybe your employer saying, hey, don't come to work, don't bring your kids to school. This is happening right here in Kirkland, Washington, where we've had, I believe, 19 or 20 fatalities as you might remember, about 11 days ago or so was the first fatality from the coronavirus in the United States. It happened less than a mile from my house. Since then, there's been multiple fatalities and, and new cases emerging throughout the U.S. But since like this virus started to happen here, at least on U.S. soil first, I'm seeing firsthand kind of what's going on, and I want to share with you some things that I'm doing in my life, share with you some results of some clinical characteristics published by the group out of Wuhan, China, that has reported a lot of uh, some of the clinical characteristics of individuals that have been infected. I also want to share with you some science about how the coronavirus gets into your body, what it does when it's in your body, and most importantly, who is at risk. I think this is the thing that's not really talked about in the media. I have right here some notes from some clinical studies, some, some journals, and what's cool about this, the only cool thing about the coronavirus epidemic is most of the case reports that have been published are now free and accessible. So you too can read everything that I'm learning about and I'm going to share with you in this short video. I want to keep this under, to four, under four or five minutes so that you can have access. You can share this with a friend or family member and you can know who's at risk and who's not. Is Sally Smith, your aunt, your uncle, your grandparent, like who's really at risk and who isn't? So I want to welcome you. I'm Mike Mutzel. You're tuning into High Intensity Health. As always, I'm grateful that you're here. It's good to see your face. Well, I can't really see your face, but I can see your comments. So if you're digging this content, I would love for you to leave a comment about what you're doing to help optimize your body's immune system should you get infected with coronavirus. Because I want to share with you the results that, yeah, we hear that this case fatality ratio is about 2.3% of people infected, but there's some nuances behind that number that the media is not telling you. So I would love to know what you're doing. If you're digging this content, please hit that like button. It really helps us. So I live in Kirkland, Washington. Why is that important? Because over 19 people so far in this region, and in fact, the first mortalities in the U.S. occurred right here, less than a mile from my home. So I literally, right before I started recording this video, my daughter's school got canceled. Work for Microsoft, we have Boeing, we have Amazon, we have Costco here, we have a lot of tech companies, Expedia. They're encouraging their employees to stay home. So it's been weird, guys um, and gals. You go to the grocery store, it's quiet. I go to the gym that's normally busy and vibrant. There's like barely anyone there. It's really weird. I'm starting to see restaurants in you know my vibrant little waterfront town, Kirkland. There's no one out. Like it's getting spooky. I'm hearing about people in the restaurant business, people at Pike Place Market. Their jobs are like they're on the rocks. They're scared. And I, I just, look, I'm trying to give you hope some insights in this video. I really feel for people. I wish we could create a GoFundMe page for all the people who have had gigs and work canceled. This can be very devastating. I'm really, I, I feel for these people. It makes me want to cry because there's a lot of concern about this, but let's just talk about what's realistic and what's not. And maybe let's first talk about how the virus gets into your body anyway, because I think that's important to recognize and understand. So this virus, the coronavirus, um, it's dubbed different acronyms, SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-1, and so forth, uh, based upon uh, its similar characteristics to the SARS virus and how it affects the body. Long, to make a long story short, again, I'm not an immunologist or a virologist or an infectious disease expert. So here's how the virus gets into your body. Of course, you know it can live on inanimate surfaces like countertops and grocery store counters and uh, shopping carts and things like that for up to five days. So to minimize your exposure to this pathogen, what you want to do is, of course, wash your hands. Now, the other thing you want to do is, is optimize your body's immune system. I'm going to share with you why in just a moment. Well, how does this virus get inside your cells? That's what makes viruses different from kind of bacteria is they replicate inside your cells and they, they have these RNA and they just keep going, going and, and uh, replicating and we get this viral load that creates a cytokine storm. Okay, they get into your body through the angiotensin converting enzyme to receptor. Now, that's a big word. You've probably heard of this. You're like, angiotensin, I've heard of that. So there's a lot of blood pressure medications called angiotensin receptor uh, inhibitors, ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, okay? So ARBs and ACE inhibitors are a huge class of medications that generally are recommended, and I, I generally recommend these to clients uh, that, I'm, that are working with their primary care doctor instead of beta blockers and thiazide diuretics because the ACEs and ARBs generally have less side effects 
than the beta blockers and thiazide diuretics. Now, of course, there's different clinical situations for recommending those. We're getting off topic, but you need to understand that this receptor is how the virus gets into the body. Now, once it's in the body, it starts to replicate you like crazy. So what's the big stink about this receptor? Well, here's what's interesting. The ACE uh, receptor is found also in fat tissue. So individuals that are overweight may be able to take on more viral load and they're gonna be more at risk for developing negative sequelae of this disease. So you need to understand if you're overweight, you have a lot of body fat, uh, you, you're, the viral load in your body could be increased compared to someone who's not overweight. We also understand that this ACE2 receptor is found on the kidneys, it's found in the gut, it's not just relegated to the lung tissue. But here's what we need to understand. What the body does is once the coronavirus gets into this ACE2 receptor, starts replicating like crazy, the body's natural compensatory mechanism is to decrease the expression of this ACE2 receptor, which leads to problems down the line. Because as you'll see on this screenshot right here, the ACE2 receptor is involved in various homeostatic and beneficial properties within the lung tissue. So when the ACE2 receptor is not there to trigger downstream genes, immunity genes and much more that are protective, the lungs can accumulate edema and fluid, which can lead to pneumonia and other complications and in increase the severity of the disease. So that's kind of how the disease takes on. Now, what you need to understand, and I'll post um, the summary of this uh, links below and also um, a screenshot right here, is the clinical characteristics of individuals who have increased disease severity. This is important because many of you are concerned about the virus. You hear on the news that it has a case fatality ratio of 2.3%. So you're thinking, gosh, am I one of those 2.3% that gets infected and then dies? Well, here's what you don't really hear the news and the media talk about. At least I haven't heard these numbers thrown around very, very often. What you need to realize is 64% of individuals, at least per case, clinical case reports from Wuhan, China, 64% of individuals that are reported to the hospital because of complications associated with the infection have other comorbidities. What's a comorbidity? You've heard this term being thrown around. This is a disease that's associated with another disease. So for example, you know, if you have arthritis, if you have diabetes, if you have heart disease, if you have, that, that would be a comorbidity, right? We know that people with diabetes have comorbidities like high blood pressure, like obesity, like increased inflammation. Those are comorbidities. So the common comorbidities that are linked with increased disease severity when it comes to coronavirus are in order of importance, hypertension and high blood pressure that's linked with increased severity and poor outcomes in death. Cardiovascular disease and cerebrovascular disease. So anyone that's had a stroke, anyone that has low ejection fraction, congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease is, in, is at increased risk for developing complications and having a severe trajectory of the disease process once infected. We also know that having uh, diabetes and prediabetes and fatty liver disease those are kind of the four or five comorbidities that are linked with more disease severity. Now, if you look at the disease severity and you look at individuals that have non-severe versus severe disease, okay, 53% of people that are infected have and have non-severe disease don't have a lot of comorbidities, whereas in contrast, 79% of individuals that, that follow this path of getting more and more sick more edema in their lungs, more infectious pneumonia, have more complications, these cytokine storms, all complications of the infection. 79% of these individuals have all these different comorbidities that we just talked about, hypertension, high blood pressure, coronary and cardio and uh, cerebrovascular disease, diabetes, fatty liver, all that, right? So 80% of individuals roughly, at least per the case studies in Wuhan, China, we don't yet know about Italy, have all these complications. So that's what is not really being talked about. You hear about, well, if you're older or younger than 65, you're protected and all that. Well, look, you need to realize that per the published case studies, it's the complications. Now, here's what's really fascinating and why I think lifestyle is a very important narrative that needs to be woven into this conversation because we need to start thinking about what can we do right now to reduce these comorbidities. I mean, I don't think it's too late. You know, if you if you're in Arkansas, if you're in St. Louis, if you're in Kansas City, there's nothing wrong with starting to fast now to reduce your blood pressure, to reduce your baseline level of inflammation. Because one of the clinical manifestations that's seen 
quite often in individuals that follow this course of increased severity of the disease is this cytokine storm where there's a super physiologic level of interleukin-6 that causes multi-organ failure, respiratory failure, and much more. So reduce, we know we've covered this on this channel many times. Intermittent fasting is a wonderful way to reduce your body's inflammation. Intermittent fasting reduces blood pressure. Intermittent fasting reduces, you know, glucose levels. Hyperglycemia was another clinical finding in all these different individuals that were infected. So you can start now because this is going to be months before we're all getting infected. And again, those of us that get infected, many of us will be just fine. It's the individuals with a high percentage of comorbidities that may not do so well and could overburden the healthcare system, which is why people are very concerned about this. Now, here's the last but certainly not least important finding that I want you to realize. Out of the individuals that survived versus didn't survive, 100% of the non-survivors had multiple comorbidities, 100%. So the individuals that don't do well, that die of this disease, that, that get infected and have respiratory failure and die in the ICU, roughly it's in the order of 21 to 28 days after initial infection, 100% of those individuals had multiple comorbidities. In contrast to the survivors, there's a, a, a dramatic disparity or difference, way more comorbidities in the people that die compared to the people that don't. So what does that mean for you, right? If you have a relative, a friend, family member, grandparent, aunt, uncle, someone you care about that has hypertensive, that has prediabetes, diabetes, is overweight, is immune compromised, has fatty liver, they need to start lifestyle change as soon as possible. Look, I don't want to make egregious claims and say that intermittent fasting and exercise and time-restricted feeding and eating a low-carb diet will cure coronavirus. I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is if it's two to three weeks or months before they are exposed, because the vaccine pipeline is not looking like it's going to happen tomorrow, okay? It could be six, eight months or a year. I think it's it's within reason, and it's certainly not going to harm anyone. The only real downside to fasting potentially is refeeding syndrome or hypoglycemia. So people that are managing their type 2 diabetes with medications need to be concerned and mindful of that. But I would embark on a three-day fast, like tomorrow, today. I would just say, look, I got to bring my blood pressure down. I need to bring my glucose down because if this thing is coming, the people that are dying of this disease is not necessarily always older people. It's people that have a lot of comorbidities, high blood pressure, cerebral vascular and cardiovascular disease, diabetes, fatty liver, and obesity. So obviously, if you smoke, smoke our already compromises the lungs. So it's no surprise there that smokers have a higher risk of uh, complications and severity of the disease and much more. So tomorrow I'm going to launch a video all about strategies that can optimize your immune system. I just wanna get this out there really quick. I apologize for talking so fast, I get fired up on this. And so what I've told my family, my parents, you know, my mom's supposed to come to town next week and my dad, I said, mom, look, just wait a little while. Do your exercise, do your fasting. She's not really high risk, but she has in the last year and a half had a surgical procedure. Individuals that have had cancer, uh, cervical cancer, kidney cancer, pancreatic cancer, um, they're at higher risk as are people that have recently had a surgical procedure. When I say high risk, they're at a higher risk of developing you know, severity of the disease. So hope you enjoy this video and hope you stay safe out there. Give the friends and family members that you know about a big hug. Tomorrow, we're going to talk all about fasting. We're going to talk about cold thermogenesis. We're going to talk about breath work and much more. So thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you on a future episode down the road. Bye now.